everyone and welcome to um, Beco Novozymes introduction to enzymes and brewing. Um, got a couple of special guests with us today. So um, you'll all remember Stas who from our previous videos. How are you going Andrew? It's good to see you again. Happy New oh, Year to you. Um, and we've also got a very special guest from um, Novozymes, Dr Aldo Lentini, who's um, casting in from KO Malaysia. Hi Aldo, how are you? Hello, German, and hello, Andrew. How are you all? I'm very, very, well good, you. very good to have you here yeah. um, sharing this information. So just a brief introduction before Aldo kicks off. Um, we've had a lot of um, interesting questions being asked about enzymes from all of our customers, both home and professional brewers, and we thought it was an opportune time to bring um, Dr. Aldo to um, talk to us first at an introductory level, and then we hope to do more um, webinars and, and seminars with Aldo and his colleague Jan at Novozymes on enzymes and brewing and distilling. But without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Aldo. And if you wouldn't mind, Aldo, please introduce yourself mm -hmm. to our um, sure. our listeners and, um, and and talk about who you are and what you do at, at Novozymes before you kick off your um, wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. So my name is um, Dr. Aldo Lentini, and as you can see from the accent, I am born and bred in, in Australia, Melbourne. So I've basically have worked in the brewing industry now for, um, I did a calculation out there, and it shocked me, it was almost 34 years. So I've been basically working in brewing for 34 years, mainly with um, the multinational, big multinational brewing companies. Um, started off with um, in R&D and technical services and Got, been working in brewing, and um, whether it's um, local, uh, multinational, um, international, and in the craft brewing area, um, involved with quality um, areas as well, and pro um, product NPD work and um, product quality. Um, so, um, for the last almost five years now, I've been working with Novozymes, um, who are the biggest um, enzyme producers in the world. Um, I am based in Kuala Lumpur and I'm the basically the senior industry technology manager for brewing for the Asia Pacific region for Novozymes. So I basically look after all the um, beverage area and enzymes that are associated with that, spe specifically around brewing. So I'm the technical person when there's people need information on how to use enzymes, what are enzymes, um, but I also do a lot of education work on um, brewing just generally within the region um, for various customers right across Southeast Asia um, and basically Asia Pacific region. So that's just a very brief summary of myself. Um, but what I'd like to do in the next hour or so is give you a bit of an understanding on enzymes in brewing and a basic introduction. So many people ask, um, one, what are enzymes? Um, and so what I'll go for this agenda is that obviously the question is what is what are enzymes um, what do they, and what do they do and we'll have a bit of discussion about that and the different types of enzymes we'll talk about um, introducing the enzymes that are used in brewing because enzymes are not just in brewing they're used right throughout the whole industry so they're used in um, biofuels for example making um, alcohol for um, for biofuels to baking um, to household care. So the detergents that you use when you clean your clothes have actually got these little enzymes in there to break down a lot of these materials, similar to what we're talking about in brewing. So so when we talk about enzymes, it's not just in the beverage area, but it's also used right across the, every industry you can think of, um, and even breaking down starch, for example. So we'll talk about specifically about enzymes in brewing, um, and then we'll break it down in the actual brewing process. So we'll talk about the cereal cooking process, um, when we're breaking down either corn or rice, liquefica um, the liquef liquefaction of solid adjuncts um, and the enzymes used there. Then we'll go into the, the main area of brewing and the, the actual brew house itself in mash tun. And we'll talk about the enzymes that are used there um, around using, optimizing the, the raw material utilization, um, work separation and beer filtration, how do we improve and why we use enzymes to improve laudering and beer filtration attenuation control. So here we want to make beers with different levels of uh, fermentable sugars. How do we do that? How do we generate extra FAN, fan, the, the, um, the nutrient components for the yeast? And then we'll 
talk a bit about enzyme dosing and the handling. How do we dose these enzymes? How much do we have to dose? How do we handle these enzymes before we um, um, use these enzymes? And then towards the end, we'll have a question and answer session when people may be able to ask some specific questions and we'll chase up some of those answers, so those questions as well. So, so basically, what are enzymes? Well, enzymes are basically, as I say, they're, they're present in nature. They're a part of nature's living tool. They're not living organisms. They're actually protein. So enzymes are basically just proteins which do a specific job. So they're present in every living organism, whether it's us, plants, um, animals, they're natural. They are, they're made up of um, pure proteins. So they're not living organisms. They're just a protein. Um, as I mentioned before, um, their industrial enzymes are made up from non-dangerous um, non microorganisms. So we actually make it, get our enzymes from either bacteria, from fungus, from yeast. Um, that's where we basically um, isolate all our um, enzymes. But the enzymes we isolate from these organisms are the same enzyme, typical enzymes that you have um, within our cells as well. Um, the enzymes are very, very highly specific. So the enzymes we are we use, which are from a protein, are very specific. So there might be an enzyme that breaks down protein. There may be an enzyme that breaks down um, carbohydrates. There's an enzyme that breaks down um, cellulose material. So the enzymes are very, very specific and act like catalases. So what they mean by that is they speed up that reaction. So if they're designed to break down protein, they can do that very efficiently and very quickly. And the advantage is because they're protein, they're easily denatured. So we know that when we um, add our wort to the kettle boil and we're boiling our wort to sterilize it, we're also denaturing any enzymes that may be present there because they're protein. So because it's a protein, during the kettle boiling, we're denaturing the protein and destroying the, the enzyme activity. So hence, it's not going to be present at all. So as I mentioned before, enzymes, they're not chemicals. So in the old days when we had to break down protein material or carbohydrates, we had to use strong acids and caustic material or very strong acids to break it down. We don't need to do that anymore. Um, enzymes will do that a lot more efficiently um, at, and without really being very harmful to anybody. So the first thing we need to know, enzymes are not chemicals. They're biological materials that can break down the substance very, very quickly. So as I said, enzymes um, cells not a living organism, they're just a protein. They're, they're found in all living organisms. And commercial enzymes are isolated from various microorganisms such as bacteria or yeast. And they're very specific in their tasks. So we have a protease that breaks down protein material. We have a cellulase enzyme that breaks down the cellulose. And we're talking about here um, beta glucans or um, arabinoxylans, things that can affect. Um, our filtration, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. We have alpha amylases that break down starch. We have pectinases, for example, that may be used in cider manufacturing that breaks down pectin. So as you can see, they're very specific functions and they have very specific reactions. And they're basically called catalases, catalases which basically accelerate the breakdown or the function of something. And this is just an, an example of what a protein would look like, a 3D example and the advantage of what makes these enzymes these proteins and ems an enzyme is that and it's probably very hard to see this model here but you imagine it's like a pacman it's got a little mouth a gap somewhere that a very specific type of product can enter that gap maybe a protein it may be a carbohydrate but if that material can fit into the gap and then get basically get chopped by a chemical um, a natural chemical reaction by these enzymes so how do enzymes work and they work what they call the lock and key so we know that if you want to if you want to unlock a a lock, you need a specific key to enter that lock to open it and unlocks it, and that's how enzymes work. Only a specific type of substrate or material can enter that enzyme to be broken down. Just like um, the lock being the enzyme, the key being the substrate. So the lock the key goes into the lock, and something happens. So this is, imagine this is a, your typical enzyme and we have what we call active site. So in other words, this is where something happens, the magic happens. This is where something gets broken down. So 
Here we have the substrate. It may be a protein. It may be a carbohydrate. And these materials are going to enter this active site and something's going to happen. And normally something gets chopped. So here we have the substrates enter the, um, into the enzyme. They get uh, into the active site and then something actually happens. So normally something gets chopped. So the carbohydrate, maybe the starch, gets chopped into a smaller fragment or a protein gets chopped into um, amino acids or um, a peptide. Once the substrate's been chopped, it leaves the enzyme. The enzyme site is now active and it's ready to, to go through this whole cycle over again and again. That's why it's a catalyst. So it chops one bit of protein, goes back and then gets another fragment of protein that comes into the exercise and we go this cycle over and over again until we stop this reaction. And how do we stop this reaction? Through either temperature or pH, or we run out of substrate um, to be chopped up. So there is a couple of things that we can do to stop this reaction from happening. And generally in brewing, it's basically changing the temperature and, um, and that stops the reaction. And we'll talk a little bit about how temperature actually affects um, the activity of these enzymes. So how do enzymes are produced or isolated? It basically mimics, if you ever see an enzyme factory, um, it looks like a brewery and it works in the same process. So we have our raw materials, such as um, um, carbohydrates and protein material for, for food, the microorganism that's gonna make the enzyme gets added to the fermenter, just like we're making beer. We add yeast and we add our um, work-based material. Um, it ferments. As it's fermenting and growing, the microorganism is producing a lot of this enzyme. And then once we've, it's been fermented and it's produced um, a solution full of the enzyme material, we then separate the enzyme from the organic strain, just like we filter out our yeast. And then we just go for a formulation and that's just to stabilize the enzyme. So make sure it can be stable for about two years. Then we package it and send it off. So. As you said, it looks like um, a normal fermentation process. The purification process is we're isolating just the protein, which is the enzyme, and, and the enzyme contains no DNA material. So we're not trying to isolate the DNA from the organism, we're just isolating the protein only. So there's specialized processes, purification processes, that isolate just the protein on its own. So when we talk about enzyme activity, enzyme each enzyme has its own specific reaction profile, and enzymes work optimally within a certain range. So enzymes work within a certain pH, they work within a certain temperature. Um, the enzyme activity or the dosing rate is also very important. The contact time of the enzyme with the substrate is also important and how much of that material that, that you want. The substrate is also very important. So in other words, if you want to, um, if you have a protease and you want to break down the prote protein to maybe amino acids, there's no use adding feeding it carbohydrates because it's not going to do anything. Similar to a carbohydrate, if you want fermentable sugars, there's no use feeding it protein material because it's not going to do anything. It's very very specific. But there's also inhibitors that can stop an enzyme from working. So heavy metals um, can also sometimes be um, an inhibitor from making that enzyme work. So as I said before, an enzyme usually works, um, the active peak of an enzyme can vary depending on, it follows this, what I call a, um, a hill. So at very low temperatures, it's not very active. At very high temperatures, it's basically dead, but it has a peak optimization. Here, this is an example of a thermostable alpha amylase that works between 82 to 85 degrees. If it was a protease, it probably works, this peak may be around 50 to 60 degrees. If it was a, um, a cellulose or cellulase enzyme, which breaks down beta-glucans, it will work around between 50 to 60 degrees. So every em enzyme has its own specific stability. And as you can see, the, st the stability of the enzyme, as it gets exposed to hotter and hotter temperatures, it will start to start to die off with time. Similar with the pH, it's that hill profile at low temperatures, or sorry, low pH, it's not very active. At very high pHs, it's not very active, but it's active at a specific um, 
pH range. And most of the enzymes in brewing will be active between five to six, of a pH range between five and six. So also we have our enzymes and before we use it, we've bought our enzymes. What are, what are the storage conditions when we buy these enzymes? The enzymes are, are formulated to be stable at, um, to be optimally stable for a specific amount of time. And normally most of our enzymes are stable for about two years. Ideally, we should store our enzymes between um, zero to 10 degrees. So keeping our enzymes cold keeps the enzymes as stable as possible. And typically they have a shelf life of around two degrees. If I store my enzyme at around 25 degrees or 30 degrees, that shelf life will drop away dramatically. So it will only be stable for maybe half a year or even less. So the hotter the temperature we store it, the less likely it's going to be stable for, um, for a shorter, much shorter time. As I said, the enzymes will lose activity um, and not work as fast if stored outside these recommended conditions. So that's why we always say to keep these enzymes in your refrigerator or in the cold room if possible. So the other thing I want to talk about enzymes is we call the elephant in the room, is you hear these enzymes, you see, hear people talk about, oh, or you hear these enzymes are either natural or they're genetically modified or they're from genetically modified organisms. So just to give you an understanding um, how these enzymes are classified. So an enzyme could be classified, produced from a non-microorganism, genetically modified organism. So what that means is, is a bacteria, and we just grab that bacteria, and that bacteria has been known to produce a certain type of enzyme. We just grow that bacteria, isolate the enzyme from that bacteria, and that's called what we call our classical non-GM enzyme. We can get that bacteria and there's the blueprint to make that enzyme um, and we can modify the organism to just use the same micro bacteria using the same blueprint and trick it to produce that enzyme a lot more in higher concentration. And that's basically what we call cloning. So self cloning of that organism to produce the same enzyme in higher concentration. What you can also do is get that blueprint that makes that enzyme and from maybe from one bacteria, but you can get the blueprint and put that blueprint into another bacteria that we know that it produces it faster, maybe 10 times more amount at a faster rate. So there we call those GM organisms. So what we're taking is that we're taking the blueprint. So the enzyme has not been changed. It's still the same enzyme that was naturally in the organism before. It's the same blueprint, but we've, we've taken that blueprint and put it into another organism to produce it at a higher rate and higher concentration. So we've modified the organism to produce the enzyme, identical enzyme, which is not GM. It's not been modified in any way, but just produced in a higher concentration. And, but we call that so like um, a, a GM or, um, organism, producing a GM organism because we've, it's a different organism. So that's majority of our enzymes are produced um, either classical or through a um, modified organism. What we can also do now, and it's also been coming very popular, is we can make that blueprint which produces a certain enzyme and we can supercharge it. So we can make that protease even stronger or even more stable um, and last a lot longer. And the way we do that is you act, this is where you actually do genetically modify that blueprint. And this is an we call protein engineering. So these if you have enzymes which are protein engineered or hear the word protein engineered, this is where the enzyme itself has been supercharged by modifying its structure. And this is a GM organism, producing a GM organism, but the enzyme itself has been chemically change to make it super powerful. So we have different classes of enzymes. We have, we call classical, where it's just as is, genetically modified, where the blueprint has not changed, but it's been produced in a different organism, or we can change the blueprint of that enzyme to make it supercharged and make it protein engineered. At the moment, the enzymes in Australia, um, protein engineered enzymes are not available. Um, or not sold, only because that in Australia, under the regulatory um, requirements is, if you use an enzyme that has been protein engineered, you are required to label it on your product. 
and most brewers don't want to put a label saying this has been used protein engineered enzymes so for that reason um we brewers aren't happy to use it um therefore because they're forced to put it on labels therefore we don't sell this in australia but it's available overseas where that labeling issue is not a um, requirement in overseas countries um so that so that's one of the reasons why you may not send some of these products um within our um, australia the other important is enzymes are seen as processing aids it's a processing aid so it's not an additive it's a processing aid and as such you're not required to lay put this on a label um, just like you may use um, kettle findings you may use um, silica gel for, to um, add silica gel or pvpp to help control your haze these are processing aids do not need to be put on a label such as enzymes so let's get back that's more the um, preliminary stuff let's get to the brewing part which is probably the exciting part so let's talk about raw materials and raw materials range everywhere from raw barley to malted barley maize sorghum rice wheat cane sugar rye cassava basically anything anything from, from maize um, rice sugar cassava and rice, um, it's all about adding extra sugar to make the alcohol where malt is probably the most essential ingredient is because malt is the um, the energy food basically for um, for your fermentation so not only does it contain um, carbohydrates to make your um, to produce the fermentable sugars to make alcohol but it also contains all the nutrients to make yeast happy so it contains all the protein minerals vitamins all those things that we always have to remember is important for yeast yeast is a living organism it needs food just like us we need proteins and carbohydrates and minerals and vitamins to stay alive yeast needs that as well so malt is always seen as the essential ingredient to keep yeast happy with food but all these ingredients all these materials um, need something to help break down the materials that we want to extract out of it whether it's proteins or carbohydrates and when we look at the composition of these cereals you can see um, malted um, malt from barley has about 62 percent starch about 11 percent protein some say um, cellulose material or um, xylanase material wheat very similar just has a higher protein content and that's why um, if you're ever doing wheat beers um, haze is also going to be a big problem with wheat beers because of the very high protein content sorghum um, not so pop much popular in australia but in africa it's their main um, substitute for barley because barley is so expensive in, in africa so the sorghum's readily available so it's the substitute for malt um, rice and maize are the very common um, adjuncts used in brewing and and why is that the case because they contain a lot more carbohydrates so if you want a lot of carbohydrates to make sugar to ferm get fermentable sugars to make alcohol rice and maize are a great substitute and hence reason why you'll see many brewers will use a mixture of um, malt because it contains all the nutrients that you need but use rice or maize because it helps gives that extra sugar to make extra alcohol and being brewers i won't go for this process very a lot but your typical flow chart of bringing your your grains your millet if you're using rice you need to do it in a cereal cooker and we'll explain why that in, in, a, in a moment after we've cooked our rice or maize we've put it into our mash tun we have, where we contain our malt water it remove all the um, unsoluble material get the liquid kettle to sterilize the liquid denature any excess protein to get rid of the um, excess protein through um, our trub remove the trub material for a whirlpool cool it ferment it package it so very simple process so the question people ask is if we're using enzymes where are they used in this whole brewing process so we break down our enzymes into at least six categories so our enzymes are either part of our cereal cooking so this is where we're breaking down rice or maize and here we need a an alpha amylase for raw material optimization so this is where we got some our malt may be of not very good quality or we're using grains that are not typical of malted barley we may be using um, rye we may be using raw barley so here we need a combination of enzymes to, 
to break down a lot of those um, hard to break down materials. We have um, enzymes for word separation and filtration. So these are, we'll talk about that a little bit more detail soon. So these are the break, I mean, our beta gluconases and rabinoxylinases. These are break down the cellulose materials that can block the filter. So here we have um, specific enzymes to help faster laundering. We have another category that we call attenuation control. So this is where we want to produce uh, maybe a low carb beers or beers with very high alcohol content. So here we've got, we had um, glycoamylases or, um, or malto, maltose amylases to break down the starch to make fermentable carbohydrates or pollinases to help break down the starch into smaller fragments that can be broken down into glucose or maltose. We have another category of fermentation control. And this is where we have proteases to break down the protein into amino acids, which are the essential nutrients for the yeast to take up um, from the wort. So we can add proteases to break down the protein to give us the food that the yeast needs to function correctly. We have another category for diacetyl control, and this uses an enzyme, an acetolactate decarboxylase enzyme, that can break down diacetyl or stop diacetyl being formed. Unfortunately, this is a P enzyme, so currently it's not available in Australia. You may see it available overseas, but under the regulatory conditions in Australia is that if, I, if a brewer uses this enzyme, because it's a PE enzyme, under current regulations, you've got a label on your product that you have used a PE enzyme. So for that reason, um, it's, we just don't sell it within Australia because brewers don't want to put this on the label. But you'll see it overseas, if you look on overseas websites, um, this enzyme will be available. So let's have a look at the brew house, the liquefaction process, cereal cooking. So why do we have to do a cereal cooking? It's because of what we call gelatinization temperature. Malt, so malt, such as whether it's barley, wheat or rye, have a gelatinization temperature around, around high 50, maybe very low 60 degrees. The temperatures that you normally do in a mashing process. Unfortunately, rice or maize have a very high gelatinization temperature. And that normally is around high 60s to 70s. It could even be up to 80 degrees, depending on the quality of the raw material. And you might say, so what does that mean? If I put rice into the mash tun, at the same time you do malt at around 60 degrees, your rice starch granules are gonna stay like a rock. So we know when we buy rice from a shop and we're gonna cook our rice, it's a hard grain, just like barley. That starch granule, and what makes it hard is the starch granules are like a stone. But as you increase the temperature, that stone, what I call of rice, which is starch, slowly starts to swell. It's like when we cook rice on, a, on an oven or stove. You add water, it's like a hard um, grain. As you heat up the water and it starts to boil, the rice becomes softer and softer and softer. The reason how it becomes soft is the starch, which is like a stone, as it gets a certain temperature, starts to swell like a sponge. And as it starts to swell open, water gets in, gets able to enter the starch granules. And as water gets in, it starts to swell and swell, and it gets much, much bigger. So it, it's like a, st um, a stone. At a higher temperature, it starts to swell, gets full of water, enters the starch, but it gets very viscous and very sticky. It's like when you cook rice and you get very gooey and sticky because the starch has absorbed a lot of the water and it's very gooey and high viscosity. If we left it like that, it's going to be very hard um, to transport this starch material very gluggy to those um, lord of tun or the mash tun. So what we need to do now is that by adding an enzyme such as an alpha amylase, we're actually, as the the starch grain starts to swell, absorbs water, it absorbs the, the enzyme as well. And the enzyme can chop up the starch from a very big piece into smaller pieces. It's not making fermentable sugars yet, it's just breaking down a big piece of starch into smaller pieces. The best ex analog examples I've got is if you've got, imagine you've got a big piece of vegetable, you've got a, a cleaver, and just randomly just chopping the cleaver um, using the cleaver to chop up the vegetable into smaller fragments. And that for smaller fragments makes it less viscous. And that's the advantage of using an enzyme is you're making this very sticky, gooey, 
solution of starch into smaller fragments and now it's very watery, very easy to handle. And it's a great example that we do normally do when we do, do this education. We get some starch, flour starch, for example, add hot water and it's like glue. It is literally like glue. Add a, one or two drops of enzyme and it goes like water again. It's, it's a fantastic visual effect that we normally do when we teach students about the impact of enzymes. So now we have an enzyme that we've added and we've broken down that starch into a very soluble material ready to be broken down into fermentable sugars. And here we have a variety of different um, alpha amylases. These are called, our products are called thermo, um, Thermomile. And these enzymes we use are thermostable. So they're actually stable around 80 to 85 degrees, it's much higher than the temperature that these um, materials gelatinize. And you might say, well, are these enzymes being genetically modified in some ways? No, these, they were, the way they found these enzymes is they actually found these enzymes in hot springs. So they actually found bacteria growing in hot springs. Um, you know, water is about 80, 90 degrees Celsius. And they found bacteria growing. And they said, how can bacteria grow in such high temperatures? And they found that these bacteria were actually produced an enzyme that is thermostable to break down starch material to keep the bacteria alive. So this is where they actually isolated these thermostable um, enzymes in bacteria that can grow in hot springs. So they use that technology to break down um, starch material, whether it's in brewing or um, in distilling or even the starch industry that make your um, sweet sugars for um, other products. So when we look at starch, starch is made up of two major components. It's amylose, which is just a long string of glucose units stuck together. So just imagine a long piece of string or amylopectin, which is the long piece of string, but it's got branches coming off it, like a tree trunk. So imagine this is your trunk of your tree, and amylo, amylopectin is basically the branches coming off a tree. So amylose contains about, about 10 to 30% of the starch is amylose, and about 70 to 90% is amylopectin. So what makes your starch really sticky? It's these side trains, chains that come out of the amylose pick chain traps water. So water gets trapped in these branches um, and that's what makes it really sticky, um, your start. So that's why we've got to break down this material and break down these um, branches to stop the water being trapped and make it really sticky. The other important when we're breaking down starch is we've got to make sure we, when we break down starch, we've got to break it down very, very efficiently and effectively. Because the last thing you want to do is have what they call retrograde starch. And what retrograde starch is, is that you have starch that get broken down into pieces, but if you don't break it down in pieces strong enough, it's like um, watching the Terminator. Um, it's that they'll reform again. I mean, it sounds weird, but if you don't break the starch down into smaller fragments and there's still big fragments of starch left over, those big fragments will reform again. And if they reform, they may not give you the blue color when you do a starch test. And also when they reform, they're harder to break down. It's almost like you trick me once, but you're not gonna trick me twice. So it makes it even harder to break it down if they get retro straight, um, if they reform again. If they're there present, if you've got retrograde starch still present in your grain or solution, they can still remain in your spent grain and they can slow down your laundering process. And they can increase increase your viscosity and make it even harder uh, for filtering and they can cause haze in your beer. So how do you make sure that doesn't happen is you have a using the enzymes at the right conditions to make sure you chop up your starch to a smaller fragment that they can't reform again. So that's why it's so important to be very effective when you break down your starch. So let's get to the brew, the match time. This is where all the action happens. So here, normally in your match time when you add your malt, and you add your water and you start the mashing process, the natural, there's natural enzymes already in your malt. There's, your malt already contains proteases to break down proteins. It, normally, it already has um, hemocelloses, beta glucanases and xylanases to break down these materials. It already has beta and, al and alpha amylases to break down the, the starch to make, alpha, um, make fermentable sugars. So you might say, then why add enzymes if you want to do, if, if the malt already has these? It's because the enzymes in malt sometimes are not strong enough. 
or not in high concentration to do the work you want. Also, it may take a lot longer for the mash tun process to get the, um, the profile that you want. So the protease, if you want to get a lot more fermentable um, amino acids, the natural protease that's in the malt may not be strong enough to give you the amount of FAN then, that you want. Hence, you need to use a protease. If you want um, very high fermentable sugars, you're going to make low-carb beer. The natural enzymes in the malt are not strong enough to get you the high level of RDF or degree of fermentability that you want to make low-carb beers. You need to add an en enzymes to help that. Um, the natural beta-glucanases in the malt are, are probably not strong enough to break down all the beta-glucans that you need to make sure you don't get filtration problems. Hence, you add a, a, a beta-glucanase, xylanase enzyme mixture to make sure you get that a lot more effective. So, and the advantage of this is, if you didn't use enzymes, the mashing process, the actual mashing, could take three, four hours, maybe five hours to get the same effect. By using enzymes, because it happens much faster, that mashing process could be down to an hour or an hour and a half. So you speed that whole process, which means you can make more product at, per day than if you weren't using enzymes. So as we look at a barley structure, you can see these little pockets, and these pockets are starch pockets. So this is where the starch um, granules are formed, these little pockets. And these, po these starch granules are within what I call the paper bag. And that paper bag, this brown, um, dark black, mature around here, but what protects the starch granules is a layer of beta-glucans and xylans and maybe even protein, which protect the starch. So before we can actually break down the starch to make our fermentable sugars, we've got to rip open this paper bag. And that's where the, that's why um, the beta-glucans and the xylans, whether it's naturally in the barley or we add it, comes along and rips open this paper bag, releases all the starch material in the solution. Now we've got our natural beta amylases and xylanases or beta amylases or alpha amylases that are in the malt to break down the, the starch into fermentable sugars. Or if we're producing fermentable, um, very high fermentable sugars for low carb beers, our added enzymes will do it. So you can see the importance of breaking down this paper bag by using um, beta gluconases and xylanases. And I'll show that structure a little bit later on when we talk about that. But you can see we've got to rip open this bag to get the starch out first. So sometimes we're using malted barley or grains that are not very good in quality, maybe high mo under modified malt. So here we have a, a situation that we've got to um, get the ma most of that raw material. We've got a raw material optimization. So here we, if the quality of barley is not that great, we may have to add prote um, a protease to break down the protein. Um, we may have to add um, other alpha amylase or other amylases to break down the starch. We may have to add beta, beta gluconases or xylanases to break down that um, cellulose material that's protecting the starch because the, the malt may not be strong enough um, or don't have enough of these enzymes to do that. So we have a cocktail of enzymes that we can use to break down these materials. So we have Ondio Pro, which is used specifically for barley, not malted barley, but if you want to use just barley on its own, has a cocktail of enzymes that mimic the enzymes that are naturally in the malt. So barley has these enzymes, but they're not alive. They're still dormant. Those enzymes only become alive naturally in the malt during the malting process. So if you're using raw barley, those enzymes are not active. So we've got to add the enzymes that mimic malt to do that. We have um, uterase, which is our protease, we, um, our ultraflow products, which are our beta gluconases and xylanases. Ceramix range of products are a mixture of these enzymes for under modified malt. And then we have our very strong glucoamylases to make um, our low carb beers or our thermomalt range products to break down the starch um, in cereal cooking. So if we're using a malt that is not very good quality, we have a variety of um, blends, the best way to describe it, whether it's Ceramix 2XL, which has a alpha amylase and a protease, Ceramix 6XMG, which is a mixture of enzymes, or Ondia Pro, which was specifically designed 
for a hundred um, for high barley content, especially 100% barley. So depending on if it's just under modified malt, this may be a good enzyme. If it's using some barley, maybe up to 30% or 40% barley, this may be a good product or anything higher in barley content on the Pro. So you can see there are single enzymes, but we also have blends depending on the raw materials that you're using. So let's talk about brew house performance. Filtration. Filtration has always been the bane of all brewers for laudering. Um, we, we want a good laudering process. We don't want to get stuck and we've got to keep on raking it because the filter bed's been blocked. And so what keeps on blocking that filter bed? It's beta glucans and xylans. They create a gel, literally a gel. And that gel blocks the pores of your laudering and the liquid just can't get through. So how do we get rid of this gelling effect? And beta-glucans and xylans are like exactly the same as pectin. So you, you remember, maybe you may do it yourself, you may remember your, your mother making jam. How do you make jam? You add um, pectin to jam, and the pectin is a jelly effect. And that's how you make your, gel, your jam, strawberry jam, which is a liquid, go hard, like um, spread, spreadable. They actually add pectin to it. And that's the same as beta-glucans or xylans. They create a gel. So how we, we've got to make sure we break down that jelly material. And we add an enzyme, which is beta-glucanases, to break down the beta-glucans, xylans to break down the xylans, to smaller fragments to stop this from happening. And why that's happening is, remember I, I was talking about that paper bag that surrounds the starch granules? That paper bag is this type of structure. It has a layer of xylans, which protects the beta-glucans, another layer of xylan. So it's like a triple layer. And that everything on one side is the starch granules, on the other side is just the normal environment. So to get access to the starch, we've got to chop up this process. 30 years ago when I was in the brewing industry, we just concentrated on beta-glucanases, because that's what everyone told us. We've got to break down the beta-glucanases. But what people were finding 30, 40 years ago were saying, well, I'm adding beta-glucanases, but I'm still having filtration problems. Why is this happening? And then people such as Charlie Bamford, um, who's now retired, but um, who was the professor at Davis University for many, many years in the US, discovered that it's not just the beta-glucans that you've got to break down, it's also the xylans. So if you want to get break down your beta-glucans, you've got to get rid of this outer layer of xylans to get the beta-glucans and then get good filtration processes. So most of the very good filtration enzymes nowadays have a blend of basically beta-glucanases and xylanases to really get this very, very effectively done. So what's the advantage of having adding a filtration enzyme? One, you get a higher yield. And you might say, well, how can I get a higher yield? It's because this these beta-glucans and xylans, not only do they block the filter, but they actually combine to starch material. And when they're bound to starch material, the, the enzymes to come along to break the starch can't get access to it because it's been blocked access to it by this gelling material. So if I can get rid of the gelling material, the starch granules all by themselves and they're easy to be chopped down. So you can get an extra 1%, 2%, 3% extra extract by removing these beta-glucanases because you, you get access to some extra starch. You get shorter separation time because the gelling effect is not happening. They're great for beer filtration because these things, if they go all the way to filtration, beta-glucans are not going to get eaten by yeast. Yeast will not eat beta-glucans because they're just too big. So they'll go all the way through the filtration process. And when it comes to, um, or they go right through the fermentation process, sorry. When they get all the way to the filtration process, they're still present and they're going to block your filter. So I remember when I was in the, working for a big brewery, we have filtration runs of um, 6,000, 8,000 hectolitres per hour, um, or per run, sorry, not per hour, 6,000, 8,000 hectolitres per run before you had to change the filters. When they were stopped and did not use enzymes, that 6,000 hectolitres went down to 600 hectolitres because the filters got blocked. They've got to keep on changing the filters all the time. Very expensive. So just shows the importance of using enzymes. And they improved the the efficiency of your brew house uh, uh, performance as well because they remove the variability of grain um, so you get a lot more improvement in brew house efficiency and the sh it makes your brew house um, 
producing worts much shorter in time because you don't have a long laundering process. The other one I want to talk about quickly is attenuation control. So here we want to make a lot of fermentable sh sugars to make a lot of alcohol, less carb beers. And the only way you can do that is to break down the starch into glucose or maltose. And we do that by adding a glucoamylase and maybe even a pollinase enzyme. So the pollinase breaks down the branches of your tree trunk where the, the glucoamylase breaks down the actual branch itself into fragments like the cleaver just chops it up along to make glucose or breaks up the actual trunk itself to make glucose so you, imagine you've got a, a piece of um, sausage and you start at one end and it just chop 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 all the way through to make lots and lots of glucose or maltose fragments also what affects the degree of if so you want to make a low carb beer what actually affects how much fermentable sugars that you produce. Obviously, one is the malt to adjunct ratio. It can affect how much fermentable sugars you produce. The type of enzymes you use can affect it. So it's all, very important to um, select the right enzyme. The amount of enzyme you use is very important. Maybe you have to use a combination of glucoamylases and pollinases if you want a very high fermentable sugar content. The mash temperature is very, very important, and I'll talk about that in a moment. If you don't mash it at the right temperature, at the right activity of this enzyme, you're, going, you're not going to get the performance that you want. So for glucoamylases, the optimum temperature is around 63, 64 degrees. If I mash it 67 degrees, the enzyme is still slightly active, but it's only going to be about 30, 40% active. If I mash it 61 degrees, the enzyme is still going to be working, but it's only about 60% active. You're not going to get maximum performance out of the enzyme. The mashing time, if I'm mashing at 63 degrees, the longer I leave it, the more chance that enzyme is going to chop up your, your carbohydrates into fermentable sugars. So it's at its optimum temperature. The longer I leave it, the more it's going to keep on chopping, chopping, chopping and working to get less and less starch material or dextrose material and more fermentable sugars. And after all the hard work you do in the brew house, make sure when it gets to the fermenter, everything is working. So make sure your yeast is healthy, make sure you're fermenting at the right temperature, um, the right temperature control, because you don't want to do all the hard work in the brew house, get to the fermenter and you're using a, a yeast that's not very good. You just defeat the whole purpose of making um, a high from alcohol content or um, a beer that's low in carbohydrates. So it's the brew house important, but also the fermentation process is also very important. The other area that um, quickly want to mention as well is fan. So I mentioned before, um, you want to get break down the proteins into amino acids. And why do you want to do that? Because as I said, yeast is a living organism. It needs carbohydrates. It needs protein to live. But yeast is like, um, like anyone when we eat, you can only eat small fragments. So like us, when we, someone says, um, here's a piece of meat. And someone supplies gives us a big piece of um, steak. We can't eat that steak in all in one go. We've got to cut it into small pieces to eat it. It's exactly the same as yeast. Yeast has a small entrance. I call it um, a transport system. It's like a, a gate. So imagine um, your yeast is protected by a fence. It's got a small gate to let food come in and out. It can't eat a big piece of protein. It just won't fit. It can only eat the small building blocks, the amino acids or small peptides can be into the yeast. The yeast can eat that to make it happy. Just like yeast can't eat carbohydrates. I, I, if I give a big piece of starch to a yeast, the yeast cannot eat it. It's just too big. It's got to be broken up into small pieces. The fermentable sugars we call, that's why we call them fermentable sugars. Glucose, maltose, multitriose. The yeast can eat those small fragments. Anything bigger than multitriose the yeast cannot eat it. It will not enter the yeast. And so when it comes to amino acids, the building blocks for protein, the yeast can't eat the protein, but it needs to eat the small uh, peptides or, pro or amino acids. Once it's eaten that amino acids, it can then reform it to make new protein, or it can break those protein, the amino acid down to produce the building blocks for the yeast to grow, like the cell wall material or even flavors. So... We had a protease, and the protease is like a madman with a cleaver. It just goes, especially an endoprotease. 
which is the most common protease that used in brewing. It just goes wild with a cleaver and just randomly chopping the pieces into smaller, smaller pieces. And in doing that, you're producing um, some small fragments, which are the amino acids. So the advantage of this is one, you produce amino acids for the yeast to be healthy, but it also breaks down a lot of the protein material that later could cause you behaze as well. It's not the most ideal way of doing it, but it's one way to break down excess protein to make sure you've got less chance of getting um, beer haze issues. The only issue you've got to be careful of, in my, someone might say, well, that's great. I'm only just going to add so much of this protease to break down the protein so I'm not going to have any um, beer haze problems. If you add too much protease, it could affect your beer foam because beer foam is actually made up of protein. So one thing you learn in brewing, what might be good in one area can have a problem somewhere else. Okay, so, so in this case, you need some protease that give you amino acids, but if you add too much or let it go too long, it could break down too much protein and you may have some foam problem, problems later. So you've got to have that balance between the two. So let's have a look at an overview of the enzymes that are in brewing. And I mentioned before the six categories, and I won't go in details again about these, but you'll see that the category is interior cooking, which is the thermostable alpha amylases, and they work around 85 to, to 90 degrees, much higher than the gelatinization temperature of starch from rice or maize, which is around 70 to 80 degrees. And Novozyme's products are called Thermal SCDS or Thermal SC4X, which is, this is four times double the concentration of this. Um, and Beerco sells these enzymes under their own brand. So if you buy something from Beerco called Benzyme AA, it's basically Thermal SEDS. Um, we do have um, sell Ondio Pro A, which is a mixture for if you're doing barley brewing. For filtration, whether it's UltraFlow XL or UltraFlow Max, which is a more powerful version of it, um, for beer filtration, Beerco sells this enzyme under the brand um, Benzyme BG, which is beta gluconases, but it's a mixture of beta gluconases and xylanases. For low carb beers, you can use AMG, which is a, a classical enzyme. And um, often, you can see these often temperatures are very similar. Benzyme, um, beer co sells it under Benzyme BGA. Or a Tenozyme Core, which is um, an enzyme that's produced from a GM organism. So the enzyme is not GM, but it's produced in a GM organism. And this is about five, six times more powerful than this one. And this can also be available as a tenzyme core or beer co sells it under eight, benzyme AT. Or this fungamol, which is an enzyme that it's a maltose alpha amylase that you can actually add, add it to the fermenter because it's still active even at low temperatures that can help you produce some fermentable sugars while it's fermenting as well. And then there's obviously proteases that you can use um, that um, can help you FANs. The, they're both uh, classical enzymes. One works around 55 to 60 degrees. The fan boost works um, same type of enzyme, but it's a bit more thermostable. It works between 60 to 65 degrees. So these enzymes, where they're added, obviously the, thermo, um, the alpha amylases are added to the cereal cooker. The other, whether it's beta gluconases or xylanases and proteases or glucoamylases, are all added in the mash tun at the beginning of the mash. Um, and these also have impact on improvement on um, fermentation, such as for the FAN. Amino um, acids make yeast happy and healthy, so they improve um, beer fermentation performance and beer flavor. And also, your beta gluconases can stop. Um, problems in beer filtration, but also reduce haze as well. Some of your haze can be also beta gluconase haze, hazes or pro, um, protein hazes come from the protein from the beginning. So let's have the last couple of slides, just have a look, look about dosing. So um, this information will be readily available to everyone. So normally um, attenuation control, so if we're making um, low carb beers, it depends on um, the question to everyone says, how much enzyme do I add? It all depends on the level of fermentable sugars that you actually want. Do you want around 85 to 90% fermentable sugars? Do you want 90 to 95% fermentable sugars? Or do you want almost 100% fermentable sugars? Depending on what you want will vary depending on, one, the right the selection of the right enzyme. 
and also the dosing rate. And here you might say, well, why have you got two different dosing rates? Is because we supply these enzymes as a liquid. And you might, well, that's okay, just pour it out. If I want it, um, um, the dosing rate says 50 grams per hectolitre, for example, um, or five gram. no, I'll go this way here, I'll tell you one core. So the enzyme, the enzyme core says one gram per kilogram of, of grist. I'm gonna add that at the beginning. But it's a liquid, so I'll well, just pour it one gram out. But the trouble is the, it's not like water. The density is different. The enzyme density, the density of these liquids are a lot different. Therefore, one gram of enzyme is not equivalent to one gram or one mil. So what I've done here is a conversion table. So if you wanna measure it as a liquid in volume wise, you, it's a bit different volume compared to weighing it out on a, on a balancer. So some people weigh it out on a balance, one gram, but if you wanna do it as a liquid, it's a bit different. So I give you the option here of measuring in a, in a measuring cylinder or measuring it on a balancer. That's, that's why the differences are, are present there. Uh, okay, the next slide. Also the same comes with the other enzymes, whether it's the alpha, thermostable alpha amylases. Um, you might say, why is there a range between 0.2 to 0.3? It depends on the quality of the of raw material that you use. So the poorer the quality of the rice or the maize, the more you need enzyme because it's going to be harder to break down. Poor quality material is harder to break down naturally. So if you have poor, poor quality raw materials, you need more enzymes or maybe even longer um, time exposure of these materials to the enzyme to break that material down. That's why we, you generally see a variability in um, dosing rates. The filtration enzymes, again, the poorer the quality of the more material, like under modified malt, for example, you need more enzyme to, to break it down. That's why you've got a, a, um, a range um, given. Again, where will these enzymes are added? They're added to the mash tun. Um, if these are added to the mash tun, they're added at the beginning. If it's a thermostable, um, thermo, um, thermomile product added to the cereal cooker, you add it at the beginning when you're adding your, your rice or your maize to the, to the water and just let it heat it up to 85 to 90 degrees. So added, anything added to the mash tun, added at the beginning of the mash tun. But we'll talk about, there's a, you'll be a little bit, I always put a but when, when you add these. In terms of temperature, temperature performance, if it's a, um, um, filtration enzyme, you find most of these filtration enzymes are stable up to about 70 degrees. Once you go past 70 degrees, the activity drops away. By the time you go to the kettle boil, they're dead because um, you denature it. And what, and once they have the denature, protein has a certain, the enzymes are protein, they have a certain structure. Once your heat goes to very high temperatures, the structure changes, it deforms, best way to describe it. Temperature causes deformation of the structure. If I deform the structure of the protein, it blocks the hole of the protein, which stops anything coming into it to be chopped up. And that's what we call denaturing the protein. We deform the protein, it's not active anymore, it can't break down anything anymore. The um, tenzyme core enzyme, you can see it's active around 63 degrees. At higher temperatures, it's less active. At high, lower temperatures, it's less active. Hence, we always recommend, if you're gonna use this enzyme, you do it around 63, 64 degrees. Our thermostable enzymes, you can see they're active between 85, I mean, up to 90 degrees. At lower temperatures, they're not active. At higher temperatures, you're, you're approaching boiling, it's gonna kill the enzyme. So, optimum temperature. And again, for pH. Um, for this enzyme, it's for thermo, it's between six, about 5.5 up to about 6. P pH. Um, so and these enzymes we add to the mash tun um, are active between five to six themselves. Here we have um, ultra, um, ultra Flow XL, which is not as powerful as Ultra Flow Max. It's active to about 65 degrees and then starts slowly to um, basically um, stop working. Thermomile um, or fungamol, which is the other one, can be used to people add this to the, um, to the fermenter. You can see this is, it's optimum temperature is around 50 degrees, but it's still active around 20, 15 degrees. So for this reason, while it's still active, where the previous 
um, enzymes, the teams on core is not active at cold temperatures. Some brewers add this to the fermenter. So while it's still fermenting, it's still producing some fermentable sugars to keep the yeast um, chopping up and producing um, alcohol product. And you can see the pH range anywhere between six to even about four and a half pH for this uh, um, fun fungal mold brew Q. And you can see at low temp pH is not very active. So it's really active when it gets about five and a half onwards. And here you can see how temperature sensitive it is. At 50 degrees, it's um, very sensitive, it's quite stable. As I increase the temperature up to 70 degrees, you can see it just totally dies away very, very quickly. So this enzyme is very temperature sensitive. So the question a lot of people ask is, where do we add enzymes? We always say add them to the mash tun, but we say to people, don't add it right at the start. So what we say is add about 20% of your grist into the mash tun with the foundation water, um, whether it's in the cereal cooker or the mash tun, and then add the enzyme. The reason we say that is, if you add the enzyme straight into water, the water itself may not be the right pH and it could damage the enzyme. Some people add acid to the water to acidify it. That acid is gonna damage the enzyme. So we say to people, don't add enzyme directly to the water. Wait until you add about 20% of your grist material. By well, that time, you're creating like a buffer. So when you add the enzyme, the enzyme is not going to be dramatically changed the pH of it very much. So we say wait to about 20% of the grist has been added, then pour the enzyme into the um, mash tun. As I said, don't add mixed enzymes with um, acids, which may be present in the foundation water, because they will damage the, um, the enzyme and not going to be very active. Make sure you, um, you're using the correct temperature and pH conditions when you're using these enzymes. So um, if the temperature act of these enzymes, such as the Tenzyme um, core, works about 63 degrees, make sure you match it around the right temperature of these enzymes. And the correct dosing to optimum um, dosing. So you notice I gave you a recommendation of dosing enzymes. Enzymes activity is like, a, um, like climbing a hill. The more enzyme you use, the more active it is. But it gets to a point where it plateaus out. So there's a point where you can overdose enzymes and it's not going to make any difference. So what we say is follow the recommended dosing rate because you might say, well, I'm going to add three times as much enzymes to really get it work. You may not get any extra benefits by adding three times as much enzymes because it may reach the plateau where it's not going to have any more effect. So try to work within the recommended dosing rates. You may go a little bit higher. It might be okay. But adding too much enzyme, it just waste of money because you're not going to get any three times as much activity sometimes so just control the amount of enzymes you do add so i've come to the end so, so um, sorry we might have gone a little bit longer but a lot we do have a, a a brewing handbook that is available that we've just recently updated which contains a lot more information available um, about brewing so it talks a lot more about the enzymes you may see enzymes listed in this brew book um, handbook that you might say, well, I don't see this available in Australia. It's because some of those enzymes are PE enzymes and they're not yet being approved in Australia. So there may be enzymes you read that are available in the US or in Europe, but not available currently, unfortunately, in Australia at the moment. So, but there's a lot more information about how these enzymes work, a lot of this information about pHs, etc., that are listed um, that we talk about and talks a lot about the grains as well, a bit of information and tries to explain why. Um, filtration enzymes are important or why protein enzymes are important. So hopefully that may give you um, a bit of understanding in that area as well. So we've gone for a bit, um, just over an hour, so I apologise we've extended that time. But what the last thing I want to do is, if you do have questions, reach out to me. So I've, I've, reached, I've already spoken to a number of craft brewers in Australia and they've got some questions. So my role is not just also selling enzymes. Um, because of my 34 years of experience in brewing, part of my, that is also training. Um, just to give you some background information, I'm also a fellow of the Institute of Brewing, and I'm also on the educational board of the Institute of Brewing. So I'm involved in the Diploma of Brewing for um, the Institute of Brewing. So my part role is not only just selling enzymes, but it's also it's education. So I'm educating people on how they use enzymes, but I'm also educating people about brewing, about raw materials about fermentation, which is my previous experience in the brewing industry was yeast and fermentation, flavor development, 
stability, physical stability, and flavor stability of products, product quality. All those things are part of my training, and they're things that I'm, um, I'm also happy to share and, and help people with that type of um, knowledge as well. Um, so it's not, for me, my primary role is to sell enzyme and help people how they use enzyme, but for me, I'm also an educator. So if you do have questions and you do want some inf information about um, brewing process or understanding why something happens, this is my email address. Reach out to me directly. Reach out to Dermot. Reach out to John, who's the our, our technical sales manager, looks after Australia, and he's probably the um, ideally the first contact person once you're also contact as well as Dermot. If they don't have the answer, they'll come back to me, and I can have a chat directly with you as well. So, please reach out to us anytime you have questions. The other thing I I've concentrated in this talk is mainly brewing, and pe the stealing people are going to say, "What about us?" We do have distilling enzymes, and now distilling enzymes are very similar to what we've talked about before. Enzymes that break down starch, enzymes that break down um, to produce fermentable sugars. Those enzymes are slightly different in formulation. They're probably designed to be more powerful because you, in that case, what you're trying to do is get fermentable sugars. So reach out to John, who's our technical sales manager. He's also a distilling expert. That's his background. That's his um, um, forte. So... If you're, if you're in the distilling industry, reach out to, Der, um, to Dermot at Beerco, reach out to John, um, and he'll also help you and give you the recommendation on very specific enzymes, which are designed specifically for the starch industry as well. So as I said, they mimic the same brewing enzymes, enzymes we use in brewing, but they're probably formulated slightly different for the starch industry. So, um, so I'll stop there because I've probably gone over time, but... Um, Dermot or Andrew, if you want any questions, I'm more happy to answer some of the questions that you may have that may be of use for the um, in the audience that may be interested to listen to this. Certainly. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Aldo. I think the first thing we just wanted to say was um, there was a lot of information um, that you shared today, and thank you very much for that, because we needed to download, you know, like we, we titled this presentation introduction to brewing with enzymes, um, and you can see the depth and breadth of it. The plan is to go into more deep dives, if you like, because you mentioned the processes, everything from cereal cooking to mashing to filtering yes. to fermentation. We could do a, an hour-long talk with questions and answers on each of those individual mm. topics. And then, of course, we've got the other whole field, which we'll do Correct. with Dr. Yan, which is um, distilling, um, which which we plan to do more of them. So. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but first I just wanted to check, Andrew, did you have any questions um, for Aldo on brewing with enzymes? Uh, I did. Uh, most, of the, most of the questions I was writing down, you answered in the, <laughs> in the, in the minute or so after where I was writing the <laughs> questions. So it was, it was really good. Um, I, you mentioned about the, the quality of the raw materials influencing how much enzymes you need to use. Um, is there a way to Correct. test test the quality is is there is there a specific specs in the in the normally product yeah. sheets or you just need to observe and adjust ends on the mount it's it's a bit of yeah and it's a bit of everything it's the product sheets so if you um if you get your product um certificate of analysis with your grains normally you'll see straight away there's some issues there so the, the um the protein content might be right at the higher end of the spec or maybe just out of spec so you yeah. know straight away you're going to have some protein issues. Mm -hmm. um, cool. The beta glucan content may um, may have a very high number. Um, it may still be in spec, but at the higher end, you know straight yeah. away you're going to have um, um, filtration problems. Um, the starch, um, when they do give you an indication of um, soluble um, extract content, the, the level may be on the lower end um, of what you expect. You know straight away... Um, it's going to be harder to break down that starch, and therefore you may need enzymes to break down the, um, the dextrin. So the, the first protocol is your certificate of analysis. Mm -hmm. That's your first call. The second call, unfortunately, is you trial it and then realise mm, it's not performing as best as I can. <laughs> that's, but that's the trial and error part, unfortunately, that comes into it. Cool. Excellent question. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I had a couple of questions too, um, Aldo, just briefly. We're... Um, Seeing with the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, a lot of um, 
disruption in the supply chain, two things, one, skyrocketing shipping costs and, and delays. Um, and you mentioned there about um, use of adjuncts and, and cereals in brewing. Um, we've seen a rise um, in Australia, in particular with craft brewers, using things like um, flake clarified maize in um, light lagers or cream ales um, as, as more and more regular mm. lager drinkers enter the craft brewing industry. And we've also seen um, a rise in the use of oats um, and hazy beers. So yes. there is, um, in Australia, we do grow a lot of corn, um, but there is it isn't really, you know, processed it's where it's fully gelatinised like it is overseas. Mm. Um, so the first question was, if I wanted to make a cream ale using corn grits um, in a craft brewery without a cereal cooker, how would I do that? So that's question one. And then my second one is, um, there are a lot of oats rolled and steamed here in Australia, and also there are even oats that are kilned and dried for three to four hours at 98 degrees, but have not been malted. If I wanted to make a hazy beer yep. with oats, um, how would I do it? But maybe, maybe we deal with them as two separate questions, starting with how could I make a cream ale with corn grits? Right. So one of the biggest problems with obviously craft brewers is a lot of them only got a, a, a I call it, um, a uni tank, best way to describe, mash tun. So yeah. it's a mash tun that it does everything. So it's a mash tun, lauder tun, and um, it may even become a kettle. Um, so one of the ways craft brewers have worked with when they're doing um, adjuncts, such as solid adjuncts, such as corn or rice, is they use their mash tun as a cereal cooker. So what they'll do is, in this case of corn, you add corn, um, and you raise it up to 85 degrees Celsius, you add it with, um, the alpha amylase, you liquefy it, and then what you do is you cool it down, you add cold water to cool it down to the right temperature for um, for adding your other grains, your malt, for example. So you've, you've cereal cooked it, you liquefied it around 85 degrees Celsius, you add, you're adding cold water to get it down to about 60 degrees, 65 degrees, then you add your malt, and therefore you go through a normal mashing process. So that's one way of using a single tank um, to do both two things at once. So um, it's just a question of getting cooling down the initial liquid uh, cereal cooking stage or liquefaction stage down to the right temperature to to add actually add, then add your malt um, to it. So that's one way of doing it with that. With oats, very similar. Um, oats um, to break down a lot of the oats, you need an alpha amylase. And the alpha amylase that we're using is um, basically very similar to the thermomol um, products. Or you can use other thermomol product, alpha amylases, that work at maybe um, similar temperatures as mashing. So depending on the gelatinization temperature of votes, which are pretty close to, um, yeah. to malt, what you may have to do is that um, when you're doing your mashing, you may also have to add a, an alpha amylase okay. um, to, um, to the mash. So we have some um, alpha amylases that work around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius can, that can um, do that. So that's you probably hear about people making oak milk, yep. and that's how they basically make oak milk. They basically get oats, add an, yep. alpha, um, an alpha amylase, um, and, and maybe one or other, two other enzymes, and break down the starch material into smaller fragments, um, and maybe a protease added in there to break down the protein material, and they basically produce an oat milk. But you're almost identical if you're using oats, very similar. So you need an alpha amylase, um, but it may, the malt may not be powerful enough to do it, and then you may need say, an extra, some more extra proteases to help break down some of the protein material um, to, um, to make it um, more soluble protein in the solution. Sure thing. Um, with the um, if we're just doing the, the rice lager from raw rice or the um, cream ale with you know corn grits, for example, and you did that high yeah. temperature cook, um, would yeah. I just add the to mammal SCDS, which is heat tolerant? Would yeah. I add anything else to yes. improve viscosity or no? Maybe? That just just that just that on its own, just yeah. that on its own. So the thermomol products are designed to to basically turn gooey, sticky. Yep. Uh, gluggy material into water. Basically, yep. goes, it turns it into almost water. Yeah. Yep. So if people really want to see visually how it works, just get some cornstarch. Go to the yep. supermarket, get some cornstarch or flour starch, yep. um, add it to hot water, it goes gooey, add a couple of drops of this enzyme, stir it around at 
um, you know, around 80 degrees, and you yeah. see it's like magic, just goes like water. So that's all you really need. Yeah, yeah. Well, that of course would also be of interest to our craft brewing customers because um, you know, like you mentioned about rakes and things like that, a lot of them don't have a lot of means to unstuck a stuck mash. So if yes. they are brewing something with high percentage of adjunct, um, viscosity it's, is very important as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in the old days, you, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, sorry, in the old days, before Amazon's come along, the only way that people, and this is where some brewers probably follow, to, I call the traditional way of doing it. So yeah. traditionally in the old days, you would add about 10% malt into your cereal cooker. Yeah. And hopefully that the enzymes that were naturally present in the malt will help break down some of that starch. Right. And that whole process could take three hours, four hours, yeah. through various temperature um, steps. You add 10%, you add some malt, go to a step, hopefully break down, add some more malt, go to another step, and that takes about four hours. Yeah. Nowadays, you get it all over within 30 minutes by yeah. using enzymes. So that's the advantage. And when you were using malt, the old-fashioned malt, the chances of retrograde starch were very, very high because it wasn't yeah. very effective breaking down starch. So yeah. some people may think of still using the old method of adding malt to it, yeah. but if you want a very fe efficient method and not have problems later on in your laudering, um, the enzymes is the best way of doing it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, that was great. I mean, look, there was so much to take away in there and, and, and we've held everyone's attention for, for a long time. So we'll, we'll, we might draw a line under it here. I mean, I did note the importance of storing the enzymes in the fridge, which is just something that we all need to do so that they last the full shelf life, which is, is two years, but can be up to three if they're stored properly. Um, the other important note you made, I thought, which was very important to note, is that the processing aids, there's no need to label for them. Um, and, and I guess the key takeaway, you know, historically craft brewers have, have liked to do everything from scratch and talked about things like um, whether they're enzymes or whatever as the tools of the big brewers and thou shall not touch. But the reality is that they're really your friend, you know, so they're naturally present in um, malts. And um, like you mentioned before, um, a process that in the past, maybe they've taken three or four hours, we can now do in half an hour. And we all know um, from talking to our friends in craft brewing that the number one thing they want to do is use their brewery more efficiently and get things through more quickly. And there's often a lot of pressure on um, on the brew house, on the tanks and things like that. So, um, yeah, they, yeah, we really yeah, thank you, Aldo, for yep. lending your time to, to Beco and, and our craft brewing customers as much as you have. Um, yep. And we hope to share more of this information going sure. forward. Yeah. And as I said, um, we can break these down into more um, specific topics as we go along, and hopefully we can do that. Um, yeah. But as I said, as you just mentioned before, Dermot, the advantage of the using enzymes, you get a chance to use a variety of different grains as well. So it's yeah. not just limited to um, barley or malt or malted yeah. barley. There's yeah. wheat and there's rye. There's yeah, um, all sorts of sorghum. There's a variety of different grains that you can start experimenting yeah. with. Yeah. Um, that, and I know brew, craft brewers love experimenting on new things. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, it's just finding the right balance on conditions. And um, so it's all available. But yeah. hopefully this is the start of some more um, more discussions that we can have. And I'm more than happy to have these um, in-depth discussions on very yeah. specific topics um, yeah. going forward. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Aldo. Thanks, Stas, for joining us again today. And we look forward to... Um, posting the, both the video content, like Aldo mentioned, I need to take the notes, we'll share the presentation, the video, and um, we're looking forward to more webinars like this. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone has a good day. And um, let's remember, enzymes are our friend, brewing with enzymes. Thanks, Aldo. <laughs> Cheers, Dermot. Thanks, Thank Aldo. you very much, everyone. Take care. Keep safe. Thank you. Bye-bye.